Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today, the presenter is uh, Bill Pan, who's a dear friend of mine for, from a long time ago. I didn't know about his most recent appointment, so that you can see Elizabeth Brooks Reed and White Law Reed, associate professor from a year ago. Uh, he has degrees uh, in, uh, in math and computer science from Boston College, BA, uh, a master's from, in international health from Emory University in Atlanta, and a DRPH in biostatistics from UNC in 2003. Uh, just briefly, his, his publications, I, I noticed his list, it has 99 I mean, what's wrong with a hundred? <laughs> uh, he's got do dozens of research grants um, and has uh, reviewed dozens of journals. And he got the uh, prestigious uh, James Grizzle Award in Biostatistics, uh, which is given out one per year in my, my department, which is also BIOS. Uh, he got that award, which is given out to the best young professor with a PhD in the last 10 years, within the last 10 years. So he, he got that award several years ago. Uh, I've worked with Bill in the field in Ecuador, where my original work was, where I like to think he learned some of his uh, ropes and his uh, Spanish. And then he uh, uh, wings and started his own project in, in Peru. And we had a lot of fun in Peru, but those are more details than I probably should be getting into in this introduction. Uh, so it's my honor to introduce uh, Bill Pan, and, uh, my, my dear friend and uh, former student. He took my demography class uh, some more than 10 years ago. And a common joke we have is that he was one of the, he was the best student in the class that year. How many students were in the class that finished that course that year? Yeah, two. <laughs> two. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for your coming, Bill Penn. Mark was in that class with me. Thanks for the introduction. So it's nice to be back here, especially since I was a student here. This is actually the, the first time I've given a talk at the Pop Center since I defended my dissertation, so <laughs> that's nice. Um, this building didn't exist, so, so I actually was in a different building, and we had a lot of fond memories, but I, I actually, when I walked up here and I saw the Nancy Dole Cafe, that was, that was really cool to see, because uh, she was really a, a nice piece to this uh, institution. It's really nice to see that. All right, so I'm talking about gold mining and mercury exposure in Peruvian Amazon. Um, but I wanted to start the conversation with a caveat and this is a conversation. So if you have any questions, please just interrupt me. If I say something wrong or if I say something confusing, just ask. I don't mind talking about something. But the caveat is that, you know, I'm a, I'm a statistician. I got trained in international health. I have a little bit of policy stuff, a little bit of epi. But this is a problem that we took on mostly because it was dominating an infectious disease project and a development project that we were trying to um, start. And I really didn't know that much about gold mining at the time. So I was trying to say, let's ignore that for now, other than the fact that environmental change is occurring and think about just environmental change. But it grew into this project where we had to keep focusing on gold mining because it's such a dominant um, force in terms of social decisions that people make, in terms of the health impacts that it has, and the policy um, alternatives and incentives that you use for gold mining to try to get people to stop using mercury in gold mining or to stop them or, or do gold mining in a more sustainable way, if there, if there is a sustainable way, is very complex. So we have this huge team of people that um, grew basically with two or three of us at Duke, and now we have people in the School of Public Policy, Biology, we have toxicologists, we have engineers. And so when I'm giving this presentation, there's a lot of things I've been talking about, and I can't say I'm the content expert on all of them, 
um, I can give an answer to a question. And if you're questioning, I'm assuming you don't know the answer. So it's okay, I can tell you whatever I want. And you won't even know if I'm telling you the truth anyway. Um, so I, I wanted to start out by thinking about um, some kind of fundamental concepts you're going to need to know when I talk about mining and mercury in general. Oh, whoops. Or I'm just going to try to start a video. Start one. So this is just going to play as I talk about artisanal small-scale gold mining. Because when I started looking at ASGM, which is artisanal small-scale gold mining, I didn't really know what it was. Um, so it's a process where you are taking up a lot of sediment and dirt. Uh, because gold doesn't exist now as nuggets, doesn't exist as seams in rock or in caves where you can magically find gold. It mostly exists as gold dust and dirt. And so you have to take this dirt, mix it into a slurry, or even kind of do some gravimetric technique to um, uh, get some heavier dirt to remain. And then you mix it with mercury, and mercury is an amalgamating agent, and I'll get to a, a second, I'm telling you what that means. But it essentially binds to gold, which is what is going on down here. Um, and since mercury has a very low boiling point, because everybody, I'm, I'm sure you've seen mercury thermometers uh, either in labs, or if you are old enough to remember, <laughs> Uh, before digital thermometers, there were mercury thermometers. Um, uh, you can actually melt mercury and then it vaporizes off as soon as you heat it up. That mercury enters the atmosphere and begins a, a cycle um, globally. The really cool thing is that mercury works, it essentially dissolves the gold in roughly a two to one or a four to one ratio. So four parts mercury, one part gold. Um, and it's a very uh, malleable amalgam. Um, so it's a really neat process. It works both in an artisanal process as well as very large scale industrial processes. It's one of the ways we purify gold. Um, but this is essentially what artisanal small scale gold mining looks like. It has a big deforestation or a land clearing component. There are individuals working all the way from mashing up the dirt and mixing to burning it in an oven or in the open field. All right, so there are some unfortunate truths that I need to make sure that everyone is aware of. The first one is that everybody in this room has gold on them. Or I'm going to bet that everybody in the room has gold on them. Does anybody think they don't have gold with them? You guys have cell phones? You have gold. Okay. Busted. Everyone has gold. <laughs> the problem with gold is that you know we mostly associate gold with jewelry. So in the United States, around 40 to 50 percent of the gold consumption that we have is through jewelry and so i always think about this in terms of you know getting married right so um, if you don't know about gold you might not know about what carats are right so usually you have these ratings of gold 14 carat 12 carat 24 carat that just refers to how pure gold is in terms of the jewelry that you have right so generally speaking the way you figure out how much gold you have in a gold ring is you can weigh that peak, that ring, and then if it's six grams, for example, and you know it's 24 carats, then almost 100% of that is gold. If it's 14 carats, you just multiply by about 58%, and then you get the amount of grams of gold that you have in that ring. So to see the general impact, if you take this data from NCHS, uh, there's about 2.2 million marriages in the United States annually. This varies a little bit. It's gone up and down, but it's been around 2 to 2.4 million in the last couple of years. Um, about 95% of people exchange rings or use uh, some kind of wedding band when they get married. Uh, but if you actually look at the percentage of people that give engagement rings, it's around 70%. Now, where did I get that data? That's not published very easily, by the way. I don't even know if I'm sure if that's an accurate number, 
but according to Wedding.com, <laughs> as well as uh, De Beers' websites, uh, they estimate that around 70% of people buy diamonds or some kind of gold ring for the engagement ring. And they estimate about 80% of people exchange a wedding band made of some form of gold, whether it's white, rose gold, yellow gold, whatever. So if you take that and you just kind of do some very simple math, that's about 1.5 million engagement rings. It's about 3.6 million wedding bands for a total of around 5.1 million gold rings that we use annually in the United States alone. If you multiply that by roughly 14 carats, which is probably the average amount of gold that a gold ring would have for being married, that's about six, 680 ounces of gold or 19 metric tons of gold that we use each year. Right? So if you think about the ASGM process, if all of this gold came from ASGM, which it doesn't, um, that means we're using anywhere between 40 and 80 metric tons of mercury to purify that gold. Right? It's a lot of mercury that goes into the atmosphere. Um, now, the truth is, you know, this is, doesn't all come from ASGM, but the other unfortunate truth that we have is that about 20 to 30 percent of the global supply comes from ASGM. And almost all of those ASGM operations that we're getting that gold from is illegal. It's an illegal operation. And it doesn't matter where, which country you're talking about. And the legality, I'll get to in just a second, but roughly that means about um, one out of every five gold rings that you're buying, or that we see who's getting married, is coming from an illegal operation somewhere in the world. Okay. So don't get married, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> or, or lose your ring, right? And don't replace it. I lost my ring. I lost it in Brazil. Luckily, my wife was with me, so uh, <laughs> yeah. she, she wasn't so upset. Uh, all right, so the other thing that's really important is that the concept of ASGM. When I think of artisanal and small scale, I think of something nice, um, small, because it's small, like a, a smaller operation. But those are misnomers. They don't actually mean something small, and it doesn't actually mean something artisanal in the concept of I, I would perceive what the word artisanal means. Small scale in Peru legally means an operation that's under 2,000 hectares. And then I can produce up to 350 metric tons daily, or if they're, if they're processing dirt, they can use up to 3,000 cubic meters per day of, of processing dirt. Artisanal means that you have a process or an operation that's under 1,000 hectares, which is about 2.5, 2, um, uh, 2,500 acres. The production is 2,500 metric tons daily, and they can process up to 200 cubic meters of dirt uh, per day. The illegal piece in Peru comes from the fact that a person who has one of these operations, they don't have title, they don't have permits to be conducting this kind of operation. So in the highlands of Peru, which are the Andes, these are mostly big Canadian companies or Australian companies that work, so they obviously have permits. In the Amazon, about 95% of the operations are illegal as of now. Um, they're trying to change that to give titling permits and giving incentives for titles, but that hasn't quite happened yet. The last thing that you need to know about uh, gold mining is the fact that ASGM is the largest source of mercury pollution globally, more so than fossil fuel burning, more than industrial production. So if you look at this, this graph, this is from UNEP in 2013, 37% of mercury emissions come from ASGM operations. Which to me, when I first learned that, it kind of blew my mind um, that these small operations globally are having such a huge impact. Um, and, it, and even more so than burning coal, which I, I found uh, even more amazing. And the problem is that this is increasing. So since 2013, uh, ILO and, and other organizations that deal with labor and migration have estimated that the number of gold mining operations of artisanal gold mining operations have increased from 30 million to 40 million worldwide. So this, these numbers are increasing and the impact is going to continue to increase. And I always get this question of where people are producing gold. Uh, so I, I added this slide or this little figure. So China, Australia, Russia, and the United States are always the top four. They've been the top four for a long time. Peru used to be the fifth most highest producer of gold. It's reduced in 2018 because there was an interdiction in the Amazon to stop illegal mining. 
so they estimate that gold production pushed uh, a re a reduced so pushed through to the number seven spot. Ghana, where we have another operation that we just started a research study this summer, is number 10. I don't think Colombia, where we have another project, um, is around 12 or 13. Um, so that's that's gold produced not just artisanally, but also in legal operations and big operations. Uh, but it just gives you an idea of where, where gold is being produced. So in terms of global cycling, so this is where the, the, the question of, of why we're dying for gold um, comes in. So when mining is going on in the Amazon, it doesn't stay in the Amazon. It's not one of these Las Vegas things where what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It actually happens in the Amazon and it impacts us globally, right? And the way that happens is that once that mercury is burnt off and melted, it has something called an atmospheric transport and a residence time. So mercury goes into the atmosphere as vapor, which is HG0. If it combines with precipitation, it becomes HG2 plus. Um, HG0 can last for one to two years on average in the atmosphere. Uh, usually if it sticks onto some kind of precipitation, it, it falls back down to earth within one to two weeks. But mercury travels, it can travel thousands and thousands of miles, 6,000 miles is, is the maximum that they believe it can travel. Most of it becomes local, but within say a, a, a 500 to 1,000 kilometer radius of where the um, the operation continues. And so it's it's not just a localized problem. The other way it gets into our own environment is uh, really how it affects us in our in our kind of our, our health outcomes. So when mercury comes back down to earth, whether it's through precipitation or just settling by dust, uh, it can enter watersheds and it, and that can occur through many uh, different processes, things like erosion, rainfall, and whatever. But anyway, the mercury gets into our uh, water system as, as HG0 or HG2, and it undergoes something called oxidation and methylation. Uh, when that happens, you're converting mercury, you're adding a carbon, and it forms methylmercury. And people probably have heard of methylmercury, but methylmercury is produced by a sulfate produce, or reducing bacteria, and that bacteria then gets consumed by little organisms, bioaccumulates in the food chain, fish will eat it, and that's why we get lots of warnings on fish consumption with mercury. Um, in the Amazon, what we see is that you can have a deposition of mercury nearby where you're far downstream of where we work, but since the Amazon connects to the Atlantic, you can actually track that mercury going down uh, all the way down the river and emptying into the ocean. And of course, this is how we get uh, mercury in things like tuna, shark, mackerel, but So just in case you've never been to the website, this is the North Carolina DHHS. So we actually have active mercury consumption warnings in North Carolina. I didn't see any for Orange County, although there are actually, uh, Jordan Lake, for example, I believe has a warning for fish consumption for PCBs. Um, but you, you can actually go to this website and they have a list of all of the water bodies that have active mercury warnings. Um, and you might've seen signs like this, you know, don't eat the fish, be, be wary about what you eat. Um, and those are things you might see in, in some heavily polluted waterways. That, that's actually from Massachusetts, not from here. All right, so the, the last kind of thing I just wanted to mention is, uh, and this is something that confused me a little bit, because you know, a lot of times when you think about mercury, you always say, oh, mercury is always gonna be bad. That's not exactly true, um, especially if you're familiar with the vaccine debate. There are several different forms of mercury and there's each one of those forms is processed differently in our bodies. Um, there's an elemental mercury that you can be exposed to, inorganic, methylmercury is an organic form, and ethylmercury is an organic form. Generally speaking, organic forms are more toxic. However, the difference between like ethyl and methyl, for example, is the way your body processes it. So once ethyl enters your body, it actually becomes uh, very easily from a demethylation process an inorganic mercury and it's mostly harmlessly excreted by people uh, so th that's why a lot of times in ethyl mercury um, you know with, with vaccines that's not really an issue in terms of having toxicity and this is just a slide i stuck in there uh, just to give you an idea of of where different types of mercury are absorbed so mercury vapor hg0 primarily we inhale it goes into our lungs and that's where we absorb it, absorb it. 
inorganic mercury. Um, you also can eat it or inhale it. Um, but generally speaking, it doesn't absorb into your gastrointestinal tract. It's mostly through your lungs again. Um, and then methylmercury is where we mostly consume it through fish, and that absorbs very nicely into our gut um, and can cause lots of different neurotoxicity. Each one of these types of mercury does have a, a problem or a, a relationship with a health outcome, but they're not always consistent. So for example, mercury vapor can have different effects on your central nervous system and kidneys, whereas methylmercury, uh, or I'm sorry, um, inorganic mercury uh, might only influence kidneys and not necessarily affect anything neurologically. Methylmercury, however, pretty much has a multi-organ target and can be very deadly uh, from different, several different kind of uh, health endpoints. Okay, so that's kind of the basic intros of mercury and ASGM. I didn't know if there was any questions about that before I go on to our specific studies. Uh, I have one real quick question. Yeah. What are the other sources of mercury, mercury emissions? Uh, so that was on that slide. There's coal, there is metals production, uh, legal metals production, cement production, oil refining, there's contamination where you just uh, contaminate sites like uh, garbage dumps can just, uh, if they get heated up, you can have mercury be released, it's very kind of small um, percentage, consumer waste products, cremation, um, or alkali industry, these are basically the main sources of emissions. Uh, but, but by far, ASGM, fossil fuel burning, and metals production are, are the leading three that we have to worry about. All right, so um, as Dick said, I, when I, well, actually when I moved to Duke from Hopkins, I, um, I moved my operation primarily from Iquitos, which is, I use the stick, it's a cool stick. I was working primarily up here on, on malaria, and when I moved from Hopkins, I moved south because I moved south, you know, from the United States. <laughs> and uh, I started working in Madre de Dios, and I chose that place primarily because there was a new road, this interoceanic highway that was being constructed. Um, it's a very small place. It's very biodiverse. There's only about 100 to 150,000 people that live there. Um, so the population density is very low. Uh, more than half the population lives in the city of Puerto Maldonado right there. Um, but so, I think I first went there in 2009 when I was still at Hopkins, and then we designed a study to look at uh, the effect of this road on the spread of infectious diseases, the emergence of chronic diseases, and changes in malnutrition. And generally, we want to know what, what the road would do in terms of mobility of people and how that mobility would influence different decision making, everything from poverty and vulnerability to, to land use change. Um, the, the road was actually being constructed between 2005 and 2011. Uh, we started our first study there, uh, it was supposed to be in 2010, but it got delayed because I was moving. We actually started in 2011, um, and then we went forward there. But we had this general conceptual model where we were thinking about the interoceanic highway generally influencing land use change, having a big effect on migration, reproductive health, and urbanization. And then we were interested in things like malaria, dengue, leishmaniasis, malnutrition, um, as well as obesity, and then chronic disease, things like hypertension and cardiovascular disease. And those were kind of our main health out, um, outcomes we were interested in. The problem was we didn't really anticipate how big an effect gold mining was going to have on all of this. Uh, gold mining, I should have shown you on the map, I'll show you the next map. Uh, was isolated to one area of Madre de Dios, and we were doing a population study across the region, so we didn't possibly think if you lived on the border of Brazil that that would have any influence on people living there uh, in terms of um, being exposed to mercury or changing the way they have livelihoods because of gold mining being present. But we were, we were wrong. <laughs> and so we started studying this mercury and gold mining uh, problem and I really attribute this to my former postdoc, Beth Feingold, who's now at SUNY Albany, who kept on telling me, we need to study gold mining, we need to study gold mining. And I thought, well, I don't really know anything about gold mining. And so I'm not sure if I want to take that on as something new. And so she finally convinced me, and we did. And 
this is being recorded so she can hear herself. <laughs> so thank you, Mara. Um, but, you know, so we started this whole process of, of looking at ASGM and mercury really influencing and interacting with the road presence and then all of these outcomes, health outcomes, being related to mercury exposure. So just to back up again, so this is the map of Madre de Dios. Puerto Maldonado is right here. This black line is the highway. That's where we did our first population level study. This green area are areas of forced concessions for primarily logging up here. The concession down here is actually a conservation concession. So they actually have it in a protected state. Um, all of this gold area is, is gold mining, although all the active gold mining that goes on in this area. The dark brown is, our, these are concessions for castaña. It's a Brazil nut, which is if you had Brazil nuts, they're really delicious, little Brazil nuts. Um, but communities essentially will, will own different um, concessions in the castaña. And then you have lots of different subsistence agriculture and large scale agriculture along the highway. And so this, this area has these competing land um, demands from people that, that live there. But also this, which is not on this map, it's not noted, but most of this region here and the region just south of the highway is, uh, are owned by native populations. So the Peruvian constitution gives them specific land area with title and so most of this area is titled to indigenous lands. And you'll see like a lot of areas where there's gold mining going on are actually um, titled indigenous land that people have invaded. And that's caused all sorts of um, strange, well not strange, but uh, difficult um, problems for them. All right, so this was our first project, the highway study. Started in 2011, we went back in 2014 focusing specifically on gold mining and the effect of mercury exposures. And then we have another plan for follow up in 2020 uh, if we actually get the funding to do it. The second study I did was um, we called the river study. And we had the almost the exact same study design as the highway, except we did it along this river shed, going from the headwaters of the Rio Madre de Dios, which this is the Andes right here, and this is Cusco. So uh, this is where the river begins, all the way to the Bolivian border. Um, that study really focused on environmental sampling, things like collecting fish, soil, sediment, um, air. Uh, we also did things like measuring river speed, river depth, um, all sorts of, of water samples to look at sediment transport because we were trying to build this hydrological model to see how um, mercury might be flowing through the river and might be uh, methylating in different parts of the river. Uh, and then we had an entire human component, which very similarly to the highway study, it had a very in-depth uh, household demographic and health survey, but also we had these uh, added modules about exposure to mercury, fish consumption, diet, uh, things that we hadn't integrated into the highway study yet. And then we had, uh, just by luck when we were doing the river study, uh, Hunt Oil, which is a company that's based in Texas, had won a land concession to do gas drilling right in the middle of a communal reserve, it's an indigenous communal reserve. And they had these things called health brigades that were going around the communities. And the director of the health brigades happened to have gone to medical school with my project director. And so they met randomly in a small town right on the edge of Manu National Park. And they were kind of like, hey Ernesto, what are you doing here? Carlos, what are you doing here? And we found out that um, Hunt Oil was doing a very similar study to what, what they were doing the study. They were doing health outreach to communities, collecting similar data to that, what we wanted to track in the highway. So we ended up meeting with a bunch of uh, the executives from Hunt Oil and convinced them that we could do a complete study of all the indigenous, native and non-native communities around the reserve to measure the impact of gas extraction um, interacting with gold mining and mercury exposure. And they were convinced that this was a good thing. And they were actually very progressive in terms of their environmental view on conservation and wanting to limit their environmental uh, impact in the region. So uh, they gave us uh, a, a lot of money and we did three rounds of data collection, 2015, 16, and 17. And I'll, and I'll show you that data in a little bit because that's where most of the research comes from. And the last study that we have is an NIEHS study. It's a birth cohort. And unfortunately, I, I'm not going to show any data from this. This is kind of the coolest data that we have, though. Uh, so we've enrolled about 220 mothers. The, the number's actually increased. 
uh, where we've collected placenta, cord blood, maternal blood, saliva for epigenetics. Um, and then we've done, um, we're doing neurological assessments starting next week at 24 months. And we're going to be looking at all of these in utero exposures for later life health outcomes. Uh, I don't have any data to show you, mostly because we're still cleaning the baseline and reporting data. And we just finished cleaning it this week. And so I don't have any analysis to show you for that. All right, so I'm going to go through some of the environmental health and social impacts that we have from our videos, looking collectively at the research and the data that we've collected. Um, Noting the fact that if you look at all of these four studies, this was, uh, you know, originally focusing on infectious diseases and nutrition, uh, changing to uh, a measure of environmental health impacts of mercury, and then really focusing a little bit more on biological mechanisms and how mercury influences human health. And so it's, it's, it's a strange set of data, um, but we have a lot of it, and we have a kind of a, a, a dearth of students to help us. So if you're interested in Analyze your data. You can come over to Duke. You just take the Roberson shuttle. It's, as good as, uh, it's just as good as UNC. Um, <laughs> all right. So anyway, so for the environmental impacts, we were really focusing on deforestation, soil erosion, um, mercury release into the watershed, and then how mercury bioaccumulates in fish populations. Now, some of this has been shown already in other research. You know, you can already see research that's published that talks about bioaccumulation of mercury in fish. The unique piece of, of our data, which I didn't realize, is that this happens to be the largest cohort of people that have been studied in an ASGM region anywhere in the world. Um, most cohorts exist with 100 or 150 people. So when we're working in Ghana, for example, um, there's a lot of research in Ghana on gold mining, but the sample sizes are tiny compared to ours, which is 1,200 households, 5,000 people. Um, and we didn't realize that we were doing that uh, it's just something that, that evolved. Anyway, so we, we focus on impacts of mining in different ways. And the data that I'm going to talk about um, primarily are the, the fish, water, and river sediment data that we collected. Although we also set up a lot of remote sensing data. We set up sensors in rivers to look at different hydrological and um, you know, hydrological measures related to precipitation and um, slope so we can measure transport. Uh, we also set up a climate station, which was really interesting because there's not that many climate stations in the Amazon uh, so that we can monitor uh, hourly rainfall. So just to give you the, an idea of how fast land use changes. So this is data from ACA, which is one of our partners, and they have this uh, monitoring system in the Amazon. So this is a picture of Tambopata National Reserve, which is just south of that highway I was showing you. Um, this is in, what was this? I think it was November 2015. And a couple miners have found, there, there's a, a couple dots here, there's a little blue house here. Uh, there's small paths here where people have started to figure out that they can find gold here. And this is a national park, it's illegal for them to be here. Um, in so five white months, sand or what is the white? It's, it's dirt, it's clear. They've already cleared that much. Course, yeah. So this is um, an early picture, probably after about three months. And then this is five months after this. But you can see how many people moved in and what the scale of it was. Now, the unfortunate thing, the, the, the picture doesn't show all of the deforestation that occurred up here as well. But it occurs very rapid. And this is a random place. I'm not exactly sure how they even chose this location to begin mining. But this is kind of what happens in the Amazon. It's people just go to the Amanjo River, begin to do mining. If they're successful, the word spreads and you get this massive influx of migrants coming in. So we have this river study where we collected uh, fish, water, and river sediment from the headwaters all the way to the uh, Bolivian border. And we were asking two questions. I'm gonna show you two questions that we answered. One was um, how correlated is ASGM to bioaccumulation of mercury in fish. And the second one was, did El Nino, the El Nino effect of 2016, did that have any influence on mercury, uh, fish mercury levels? So for this particular study, we divided the river into three sections. So the sections are, since this is, this is mining right here, we have section one, which is upstream of mining because the river flows that way. 
uh, which is west to east. Uh, we have the mining section, and then we have far downstream of mining. And we just divided that up because we thought, all right, most likely you're going to get most of the mercury here. You'll have very low mercury levels up here. And then downstream, we weren't sure how much mercury would actually detect. So these are some of the, this is um, a publication by PhD student Sarah Duringer. She's now um, in San Francisco. Uh, but it shows all of the fish mercury levels from fish that we collected in 2012, 2013, and I believe 2014. Uh, we separated fish between carnivorous and non-carnivorous fish because since mercury bioaccumulates, you're going to expect different levels of mercury in the two different trophic levels of fish. Um, this graph essentially shows you, there's a couple things happening in this graph. So the, this um, dotted line, is the US EPA threshold for fish mercury. If you're below that level for fish, you're, you're okay. The, the dark line is the WHO threshold for fish mercury levels. Um, the, these little kind of pink and blue, these are confidence intervals for carnivorous and non-carnivorous fish in each of the sections. And what this essentially is telling you is the fact that upstream, carnivorous and non-carnivorous fish are below both US EPA and WHO thresholds for fish mercury. In the mining areas, the carnivorous fish are above, but non-carnivorous fish are probably okay. And then far downstream, uh, slightly elevated from compared to upstream, but still below WHO thresholds, right? So that was, that was good for, um, good to know for the people who live in that area. We calculated uh, for each one of these regions and for people who were involved in our study, recommended weekly consumption of fish based on the fact if you are an adult or a pregnant woman or a child. And we essentially can tell people that um, if they are a woman of childbearing age, uh, you shouldn't be having more than two fish meals per week if you live in a mining area versus if you are upstream, you can pretty much eat anything you want and it doesn't matter if you're a child or a woman of childbearing age. If you're far downstream, if you're eating carnivorous fish and you're a child, probably don't want to have two more, more than two helpings per week. Um, but for pregnant women and for other adults, it's probably okay. The other thing that we tested was the water. So this is, uh, so we, we collect this water and we filter it and we get that, those particulates out of the water and we can test that for mercury. And what you see is the same kind of trend. Um, upstream, relatively low levels of mercury. Right around ASGM, it's, it's highly elevated. And then it essentially stays elevated as you go downstream, which was pretty interesting. Now, one of the arguments that was made when we submitted this in the paper was the fact that the reviewers were saying, well, you probably just have more suspended solids downstream, and that's what you're catching as you go downstream. So we, we looked at that, and we looked at the amount of suspended solids as you go from section one, two, and three, and actually what you see is that um, the amount of suspended solids that were in the river were fairly equal. Uh, going from upstream to downstream. All right, so the, the second question was about El Nino and how El Nino is related to mercury exposure. Um, was that the right time? Oh, I can go faster. Uh, so we were testing whether or not El Nino was related to uh, fish mercury levels. And the reason why biologically that happens is because if you have more flooding, you can have more methylation and that you can have greater bioaccumulation of mercury in fish. So that was kind of the premise. So we just simply created um, a time series of fish that we had collected between 2012 and 2017. We looked at total fish mercury levels and we created a very simple model of whether or not El Nino was related to um, increased fish mercury. And so what our data say are that if you look at before El Nino, um, 47 out of the 200 fish had mercury levels that exceeded WHO. And during the El Nino year, 60 out of the 64 fish that we obtained had uh, mercury levels that exceeded. And if you fit this into a model, adjusting for carnivorous and non-carnivorous dry and wet seasons by section, you still see a very significant effect of El Nino. Now the piece that I wanted the student, and we haven't published this yet, um, I wanted the student to try to figure out which aspect of El Nino was important. So we have something called a land data assimilation system from a learning project that I have, which we get daily measures of rainfall, soil moisture, and flooding. Um, so I wanted to kind of look at those parameters to see if they were related to fish mercury. And we haven't finished this piece yet, 
uh, but we're exploring these things called distributed lag models um, to figure out whether or not specific lags of precipitation or temperature or soil moisture might be associated with increased uh, fish mercury. We're not quite sure yet, but for all intents and purposes, the effect of El Nino is very significant. Uh, and that alone is, is something that we need to make sure that we can report. Right, so there's a lot of other um, environmental research that we've done. I'm not gonna go over all of them, uh, but I will tell you that we have run these scenarios of deforestation and different policies in ASGM to see uh, if the government were to change the way they title or allow different areas to become uh, mining accessible, uh, what impact that would have on mercury mobilization. And that paper has been accepted for revisions, uh, but it essentially shows these very high impacts of allowing miners to operate in different regions versus scattered versus far upstream or downstream. Um, which will be a nice little contribution to, uh, to policy. All right, let me quickly go over the health impacts because I'm running out of time. I apologize. All right, so the, whenever we think about health impacts, we also want to start out with a question of are people actually exposed? So we basically collected all this data. We combined it into one data set, and we wanted to quantify how many people actually had high mercury levels. So when we do this in a model and we can show it on a map, we have estimated that 41% of the population living in Madre de Dios have a uh, mercury exposure level that exceeds WHO 2.0 micrograms per gram of hair. The US EPA level is lower, it's 1.2, so it's, I think that estimate was around 65% of the population. So if you can imagine you know, the crisis in Flint with high lead, um, if we were to say that 65% of the people living in Flint had a high lead. This would be a major emergency. I mean, it's an emergency already, but this is for everyone living in the region uh, with such a high mercury level. So it's, it's a major impact. So the, the health outcomes that we look at, uh, we've looked at a lot of endpoints, neurological, immunological, anemia. We've looked at adult hypertension and chronic kidney disease. Uh, I'm only gonna talk about two, neurological and hypertension. But the data come from uh, the Amacray Reserve cohort study where we have about 1,100 households enrolled, 23 communities, about half are native, half are non-native, and it includes about four urban communities. So we have 4,083 individuals. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this, although this is the study design. It was a population census, uh, except in urban areas where we just did a, a random sample of 50% of the people living there. Uh, we focused on women of childbearing age. So if there was a woman of childbearing age in the house, they were, they were eligible to be enrolled. Um, and then we collected a bunch of biomarkers from adults and, and children. So for the cognitive development piece, what we essentially are testing here is the fact that there's been a lot of research on acute exposures, meaning very high levels of mercury, influencing neurological development and cognitive development. What we wanted to show was if you had sustained chronic exposure, meaning you're just above the thresholds for WHO or US EPA, how does that influence a child's cognitive development? Um, so we did this in the Amherst Reserve cohort study. We enrolled about 212 children from that study. Uh, they were aged five to 12 across the 14 communities. To be eligible, they had to have a hair sample from the prior wave of data and then in the field, we did a neurological clinical exam as well as three different cognitive exams, including something called the Woodcock Munoz, as well as a visual motor integration test. Uh, if you're familiar with these tests, the, the Woodcock Munoz essentially gives something similar to an IQ score, and the visual motor integration test uh, gives us things about fine motor skills and visual acuity. Um, the way the sample looks, we have about 57% were female. We have 16% uh, of the population is native, and about half of these kids actually had Spanish as a second language, which um, ended up not affecting our results, but it was something to be aware of. And roughly half of the kids had a mercury level above US EPA levels. So what did the results show? So the results basically demonstrate that in terms of the visual motor integration scores, uh, if you adjust for sex or if you do full adjustment based on these covariates, which are on the second line, um, you have a 
almost significant effect between mercury and cognitive development. But in terms of cognitive ability with the IQ score, uh, we saw consistently significant effects for mercury. So what this essentially tells us is that for a one unit increase in the natural log of hair mercury, you're going to see 3.7 unit decline in IQ scores, which is equivalent to a 3% or 4% decline in IQ scores. Okay. Um, and that's for each one unit increase, right? So it's a pretty high impact. Now switching quickly to hypertension. Uh, let me just do this real fast. So we are looking primarily at high blood pressure, primarily because blood pressure is the leading cause of, of uh, loss of dallies. So what we are hypothesizing is the fact that you have mercury exposure influencing either endothelial dysfunction, which affects the way your, your arteries are constricted or not through different mechanisms, or you can have mercury exposure inducing arteriosclerosis, which forms plaques and narrows and blocks arteries. Either way, both of those processes induce hypertension. So what we found was if we looked at these, uh, we had 300 people, um, about 200 females and about 100 males. And we looked at this interaction between mercury and sex. So overall, there was a significant effect, but it was actually differential between males and females. So females uh, do not have according to our data, did not have an effect of increased hypertension or increased blood pressure with increasing mercury levels, but males did, which is kind of fascinating for us. Uh, we're not exactly sure why. Obesity here is a major problem. About 70 or 80% of women are considered overweight or obese, even in rural areas and in indigenous areas, um, whereas uh, males, generally, it's lower. It's around 40%. Uh, but that, so that's, uh, for us, it was kind of surprising. This is a bunch of other research we've done on health. Again, I'm not going to get into it. I just want to show it to you. I just wanted to end with some of the social aspects that we're thinking about in gold mining. Uh, this is something that we've started at Duke uh, in the past year to kind of engage policymakers a little bit more to figure out how we can um, inform ASGM policymaking, especially with something called the Global Mercury Treaty. Uh, so in 2017, we had roughly, I guess, 150 signatory countries sign on to the Global Mercury Treaty, called the Minamata Treaty. Um, but the problem with the Minamata Treaty, I guess the challenge, is the fact that in these gold mining environments that have lack of governance, very little local enforcement, very few incentives for miners to want to change, how do we actually implement policy or develop policy that can change behaviors? Uh, this becomes a difficult, complex problem. So we started mapping this out and identifying all sorts of problems and all sorts of stakeholders um, that influence the mining industry in modern videos. Uh, so we have this policy question for ourselves. We identify the fact that there's lack of governance. There's fragmented ways that interventions are implemented. And there's really scattered research that's not done in a cohesive, a collaborative way. And so uh, we identified all sorts of different stakeholders, and then we mapped them in something called a power analysis, which means that you know if you take, for example, the small scale miners, and you think about the influence they have on policy, it's relatively low right now, but they have a high interest in it. Whereas the government has very high influence, but in comparison to miners right now, uh, their interest is not that high, you know, they're not that engaged in the, in the policy debate. So where we want to get to is this place where government and miners are sitting on the same scale where they both are highly interested. Obviously, government will have more influence, uh, but you have all of these other partners that are influencing and kind of contributing to this, uh, this problem. Now, how do we go from the first to the second stage? Uh, we've mapped this out. Um, through something called scenario mapping. And we've thought of a couple different ways of doing this. Uh, the basic way is essentially trying to engage policymakers and engage stakeholders at different stages of policy. So not doing everything at once, but trying to do it in a very strategic and a, in a cohesive and collaborative way. Um, that probably oversimplifies what we're actually doing, uh, but you know, it's, uh, I can discuss more of it if you have questions about it. Um, 
And finally, just what we're doing at Duke, uh, we actually, as, as part of what I was just showing you, we, we created something called, uh, we, we don't actually have a name for ourselves yet, but we, more or less we call ourselves like Duke Gold. Um, <laughs> but it's, a, it's our, our ASGM team where we're, we're combining the research teams from Peru, Colombia, Brazil, and Ghana. We're thinking about both collaborative research and cutting edge research questions, as well as how we engage policy so that when we talk to um, government bodies, we're doing it as one voice rather than four different voices coming from Duke. Um, so we think of like, if you've heard of One Health, we think of One Duke. Uh, the other thing we've talked about creating something called a super center. This is my actually name. I, I wanted to be the super center because I love the word the super center. But it stands for the sustainable use of planetary environmental resources. So we have, we've kind of shocked this to different uh, deans and directors and uh, different people across Duke and it seems to be gaining traction. And as soon as we see an, an opportunity to kind of put this forward as a proposal um, to create this kind of center, that's probably what we're gonna, we're gonna be doing. So that's that's basically it. This is our huge team. Um, sorry, I only left five minutes for questions, but I'm, I'm around. I live here, so you can ask me whatever you want. You mentioned there was a crackdown on the mining in this area. Yep. So what did that look like? Did they go out to the camps and like run people off, or? And did they people come back or what? what so they happened? had two different. So they had one in 2016 where they the army went in and burned down mining communities. Wow. Burned equipment and blew it up. They realized that wasn't a good strategy because they just came back angry. Um, now what they're doing is they are still kicking people out, but they're saying we're kicking you out, but we're going to allow you back in as soon as we figure out the mechanism. So they've been allowing, um, they've been trying to phase in titling where the new governor wants to create 100 new titles for, for legal mining titles in this year and then another. But they're still going to use mercury, right? They will still use mercury. So that's, you know, the big challenge is one thing is just controlling the land use and the, the invasion of the land. And another step is how do you stop them from using mercury, right? So it's, those are just two different right. questions that need to be addressed. So it's it's all visible from the satellite imagery, right? So do the regional authorities, I mean, do they look at the satellite imagery and know where these places are? They do. Okay. Yeah. So it's no secret as far as really what's going on. It's not, but you need to, you know, you need to have somebody scanning the satellite you know, weekly or monthly to right. find out where they are. Thanks. Yes, Carmen. Please raise your hand. And uh, for the uh, mercury, it's a uh, level different in the river. So there are you know, significant difference between three sections, particularly in the middle. And that doesn't seem to match with the way that you know, mercury was really primarily, primarily through uh, evaporation and then deposition. I would say they are pretty you know, continuous, uniform distribution within short distance. Mm -hmm. okay. So we've been measuring uh, atmospheric deposition at a canopy just below the canopy and the ground levels. There's a PhD student named Jackie Gershon that's doing this. And she's doing it across different transects of the river to see if there's some kind of atmospheric transport that pushes mercury vapor from one area versus the other. And what she's finding is that it, it, it doesn't really travel upstream because of the way the, wind, the winds blow. Oh. Um, it, the winds, I think they blow downstream. Same with the river. That's where you're, she's finding most of the deposition. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, it's great, Bill. Um, of all the many assessments you're doing, I did not see diet or nutrition status there. So we just have a publication on uh, the dual burden of disease. That was one of the slides I said I'm talking about. But we, we have, uh, we struggled with a diet question, to be honest. Uh, we have these modules on what people eat. Problem is when we ask for something like you know, a 24 hour food recall or a seven day food recall, since it's seasonal, what you ask them in those, you know, at the particular time you visit, if you visit it four months later, it's gonna be very different. So we've modified our diet questions to be, what do you normally eat across the year? And we can try to classify that as um, Western diet versus non-Western diet foods, 
uh, we have a paper that tries to match the Western diet uh, score that we created with selenium as a biomarker for uh, as kind of uh, emergence of the Western diet. Uh, but I can tell you that anemia is very high. Uh, probably around 40 to 50 percent of kids are anemic. Um, about 20 percent of kids are stunted. Um, and I think it was around 30 percent of kids are overweight or obese. And those numbers are increasing. Anemia is going down though. Um, mostly because in 2017 or 2018 there was a Peruvian law that uh, they had to have interventions on anemia, and we were actually trying to measure the impact of those laws in our study areas. Uh, the problem is when we met with every single intervention group that the local regional Ministry of Health uh, coordinates, nobody had on the ground monitoring data on what foods were being given when because they're given a lot of latitude on if you're working in an indigenous community or if you're working upstream, they basically get big sacks of food or money to go buy food themselves. And nobody goes and checks to see what's happening in those communities. Um, but that's, that anemia rates are coming down, but stunting and obesity are going up. Uh, please speak up loudly because we're all being recorded. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm curious, uh, it's interesting that this project is going to the different uh, you know, places in Latin America. I was just curious about why Mexico is not on that list. Is, is it because Mexico has different like land conditions on where you know, gold is being extracted or what, what we think? We just don't have a collaborator in Mexico right now. No. So that's something to think about. Really, this is an impressive project. This, this shows the value of getting a serious background in international health and epidemiology, along with statistics, along with uh, rudimentary Spanish. It works. Uh, and, and following a project for a sustained period of time, uh, we have a one UNC student in geography and biostatistics uh, who has actually been working with uh, Bill over at Duke. So, it can be done, and, and this is a really quite an incredible project. And I know that he's had an impact uh, on policy in Peru, which few of us actually uh, find direct impacts of our research on policy. So uh, I was quite fascinated with your trying to map the policy uh, effects as well. Um, any more, any more questions? Yes. Uh, Just one quick question. Did you say the women that you interviewed were of reproductive age? Yeah. So the male-female difference, um, I wonder if, if that's different post-menopause. It, it could be. Um, we do control for age. Most women who are with a partner, uh, actually, I won't even, I, I don't know the data. Um, not my head. I'm going to guess, though, that most of the men are close in age to the women, tend to be older though, you're right. Right, yeah, because if they were, I was just thinking if it's reproductive age, we know there's a big difference in heart disease, which narrows after menopause, so I just wondered if that affects. But you know, we, we see that effect in the native communities too, if you just look at the native communities, and those men are all very young, and the women are very young. The problem is in the native communities is that surprisingly 80% of women were overweight or obese, whereas men, it was closer to it was much lower, it was like 15 or 20 percent. Yet men had measures of chronic kidney disease and hypertension that were much higher than the women. Uh, Early exposure. Last, last question. Yes, in terms of the measurement for anemia, did you find an association with children who had exposure or high levels of mercury being associated with higher levels of anemia? We did. So we, the, we have a paper on that in uh, American Journal of Tropical Medicine. So we actually we adjusted for folate and I think vitamin B. Uh, which are part of the mechanism with causing different forms of anemia, especially related to, to mercury exposure. Um, but we essentially find, uh, I think it's one, one unit increase of mercury was associated with like two units of kidney gold and lower, something like that. And I can't remember the exact number. Uh, but it's by Karen Winehouse is the first author who came out with the drug. And then we have another, actually another master's student who just finished um, she was trying to look at this a little bit more uh, completely by getting uh, what they call the complete blood counts uh, from people that were, were anemic and try to see if they could differentiate what types of anemia they have and then correlate them.
feel like that could be a good policy piece as well because anemia is now a priority there in Peru and in my experience at least in Loreto that anemia is not going down especially if you disaggregate from the urban from the urban areas where anemia is decreasing in the urban areas but outside of those centers anemia is, is pretty much staying the same so a good policy policy piece there okay finally some of you may know my wife um, I have no wedding ring, so I have not contributed to this problem, uh, but we've been married 49 years anyway. Um, so I want to thank Bill for his coming over, and I hope some of you will follow him uh, all the way over to Duke sometime and learn more about him and collaborate too. Thank you.